Um, so thank you everyone for uh, uh, coming back. So this is the um, the fourth and uh, maybe the uh, the last um, of um, this series. Um, I would certainly be um, glad to, to come back and speak to you guys again, but I think in terms of creating something that has a um, coherent um, sort of, you know, syllabus behind it, uh, this is, is really going to be the conclusion to the story. Um, I haven't been able to produce everything that I wanted to, um, to, um, to discuss with you guys, but I think that um, all together is like a, a, a single body of, of, of work for further study. I think it's quite, um, it, it, it's, pretty compelling in and of itself. So we can always discuss things later if we want to um, re return to certain concepts or, or something, but um, I'm pretty pleased with how we're, we're wrapping this up. So the um, in the uh, on, on re-watching the third lecture, um, I was a little disappointed in how I handled um, some of the material. I think that, you know, I really wanted to nail certain aspects of, of concentrated liquidity, and while I think that it was it was still pretty good, I think that there's um, there there are uh, some components that I think I could have done a better job explaining. And so, in contrast to the previous lectures where I have um, offered solutions to some of the homework material, instead I've decided to actually do a full addendum to the third lecture, and um, hopefully really give you the the uh, a much stronger theoretical framework. Um, to understand concentrated liquidity. And this is going to be of assistance as we move through um, some of the other concepts of, um, of, of this lecture material. Um, and then also moving into, um, you know, into, into further research after this. So we're not going to be doing um, the, the homework questions. Instead, um, we're going to be revisiting um, some of these concepts. So just recall that um, from the, the last lecture, what I was uh, what I was trying to demonstrate with some sort of visual proofs is that the way that um, the the Benkel v two formula operates is to essentially add an amplification factor um, to the Benkel v one formula, which means that you end up with a curve that behaves as if it has more liquidity in it than it really does. Um, and in the um, in the language of the patent, we refer to this as virtual liquidity or, or virtual token balances. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can actually trade virtual tokens. It just means that the you know the liquidity pool behaves like it has more tokens than it does, and we refer to that difference between um, the uh, the way that it behaves and how many tokens it actually has as being a virtual balance. So you can't trade those tokens out, um, which means that you still end up uh, in this position of of running out of liquidity um, at, at some at some point. Now the the problem I think that um, you know with how I presented it was that when I gave these formulas and they were on a very large number of slides, um, I've got this sort of equal C uh, part, which actually just means that this is a constant value. Um, so it didn't mean that these are necessarily the same value, and this is where I want to um, come back and actually uh, re you know change the way that these formulas are presented. So the, the, the reason why I want to change it is that it isn't apparent necessarily that that C value is under the influence of this coefficient, um, or it even suggests, I think unhelpfully, that these two numbers might be the, the same. And so um, I think to, to demonstrate how this C, um, this C constant uh, looks under different situations, let's come... Um, Let's you know have a look at a very familiar uh, category of liquidity pool, which is one that just contains two stable coins, um, which is um, you know going to be of assistance when we come when we uh, look at the the stable coin curves later in this, in this lecture. Um, but let's just imagine that we're adding um, you know equal quantities of both of these tokens, so it's a two token pool, and obviously we have the the same revert, um, reserve ratio. Um, for both of these assets. So in the Banco V1 case, um, the virtual balance you could say is equal to the real balance. Um, whereas in the Banco V2 case, because we've applied this amplification um, constant, in this case 10, the virtual balance of tokens um, looks to be 10,000 rather than 1,000. Um, and you know, given the formulas, the way that I presented them in the last lecture, 
you would see that the liquidity constant in the Bank of V1 case is 1,000 and the liquidity constant in the V2 case is 10,000. Um, but because they have the same symbol and because we're referring to the same token balances, this is where I think it's actually a little bit confusing. So instead of um, using the same symbol for both of these constants, I thought maybe it might be better if we introduce a new constant, capital C, where capital C always refers to the, um, the amplified size and little c always refers to the real size. So in this case, um, you can see that Bancor V1 is just a special case of Bancor V2 in the sense that it's, it, its amplification coefficient is one. Um, and in the, the V2 case here where we're applying an amplification coefficient of 10, um, the, uh, the amplified size is 10,000. But this means that we can actually give both of these pools um, the, the little c, the lowercase c constant of 1,000. And this, I think, is going to be, um, it, it's going to make the contrast between virtual and real reserve invariants a little bit more precise, or at least it's going to be stated more explicitly. Um, and uh, I think, uh, you know, some of the things that I said in the last lecture will become more evident now um, in, um, you know, through the, through the lens of this treatment. <clears throat> so, Rather than saying that um, the this amplification uh, amplification coefficient multiplied by you know the product of um, all of these um, all of these virtual balances raised to or sorry all of these real balances raised to their um, their respective weights equaling c we're going to let it equal capital C and then it's just a matter of having a look at what is the relationship between capital C and um, and the amplification coefficient and of course no mystery it's just um it's just a times um whatever little c is so rather than saying um the you know the the v2 formula is equal to this constant little c let's just say that it's equal to a times c um and then from there i think we're going to be able to derive the v2 formulas in a much more um convenient maybe a little bit more intuitive manner so we're now going to take this relationship and define V2 in terms of V1 so that we can get to the invariant equation that we were that we've already derived in the in the last lecture. But this time we're going to derive it um, a little bit more explicitly um, in the context of formal logic. So there is going to be some language on these. There are three slides of this, and I'm just going to tell you what these things mean um, because uh, I realize, well, first of all, I may be abusing the notation. This is something that I conceded in lecture one um, that I'm known to do. Um, so I'm just going to explain what I mean with, with, these, with these statements. And I assure you, it's a little bit more, um, it, it's not as scary as it, as it first looks. So the first thing to realize here is that we're saying that the V1 invariant function, let's just call that capital I, um, is written like this. So we're saying that I of um, a bold-faced X uh, is the product of all of these uh, real balances raised to their reserve weights minus some constant value. And that's what, uh, you know, this just means is congruent to this or it means exactly equal to this. Where this X, this bold-faced X is not a single point, but is many, is, is not a single value, but is a list of values in n-dimensional space. Um, and the, um, you know, the reserve weights are, are again, exactly what they've meant um, prior, what, what we've discussed previously. And so now, once we have this, um, this equation, we can um, define a, a predicate, um, which we're going to call V of X, which is true if and only if um, I of X is equal to zero. And this will define a, um, a, a set of coordinates that form the, the bonding curve in two dimensions or the bonding surface in, in three dimensions and hypersurfaces um, beyond that. So we say that for um, you know that the the, um, the set of all points x that satisfy this predicate is the bonding surface. Then for v two, um, before we say that the uh, what the actual function is, um, we're going to say first that there is a um, uh, that we're just going to say that it exists. And that it has similar properties to the um, to the V1 invariant. 
So where we were using I for the V1 invariant, we're now going to use capital J and Y here instead of X, but where Y is still a list of, um, of coordinates in n-dimensional space. So we're going to use the same predicate W um, that's true if and only if whatever this invariant is, and we don't know what it is yet, um, is, is equal to zero for um, a set of coordinates that Y represents. And so we can also define a, um, a surface or a hypersurface, um, which is the set of all, um, all lists of coordinates Y that are in you know, the, the reals in N dimensions where this predicate W happens to be true. So it's not, um, you know, it, it, it's not too complicated. All we're saying is that, you know, whatever we're defining the bonding curve to be, or whatever we're defining the bonding surface to be, is all of the coordinates where some function, you know, is equal to zero. So, and this is the part that I don't think I nailed in the last lecture. Um, what we are trying to do here is to define how the V1 variant and the V2 variant are related to each other. So we've already said that there are these two surfaces. One, one surface S is the one that we get from the V1 function, and the other surface T is the one that we're getting from this, this new V2 function, or functions I and J in the language of the last two slides. Now, I'm just going to declare that there is a point that I'm going to call the pivot, which is this lowercase bold face P, and I'm going to say that it is a point that is on both of those surfaces or on both of those curves. So again, this, um, you know, to read this, um, this formal logic sentence, this just says that there exists exactly one um, point in n dimensions such uh, that is a member of both the sets S and T. So there is uh, a set of coordinates that is on both the V1 and the V2 um, surfaces, meaning that if we take those coordinates and put them into the V1 formula, we will get zero. And if we put it into the V2 formula, we will also get zero. And there is only one list of coordinates that will give us that result. Every other um, set of coordinates that you feed into both of those functions, um, you might get zero in one of them, but you won't get zero in the other ones. This is a very special, very unique um, point. And it's going to be the thing that, that gives us a lot of power, um, both in defining what the V2 function is, but also in um, solving other problems down the track that I'm going to show you um, in just a few slides time. But this actually isn't enough. What we're also going to say is that at this point, whatever it is, this list of coordinates in n dimensions, that the partial derivative of um, both functions i and j with respect to any of those dimensions, it doesn't matter which one that you choose, um, will be equal to each other. And that any point, um, the, um, that we're saying, uh, so for any other point, which we're calling Q, um, that is not P, right? So the, to way, the way to read this is just um, for all, oops, sorry, for all points Q, in um, the, the reals and n dimensions, except for this point P. That's all that thing means. Um, the, uh, the partial derivative of the function I in any dimension is not equal to the partial derivative of the function J in the same dimension. So long story short, I know that this is a bit of a mouthful. What we're saying is that there is one point that is on both of these curves or is on both of these surfaces. And at that point, the partial derivative or the, the gradient in any dimension is the same also on both of those curves. So at this one place, like if you were to be on P, right? Imagine shrinking yourself down to a, um, you know, to a single point. And if you were standing here, what we're really saying is you would not be able to tell which function you were on, right? It would look the same at this point if you were on the, the V1 function and the V2 function. And that is what is unique about this point. Any other point on any of these other surfaces, you would know, right, that this is the V1 curve or this is the V2 curve. Um, and using this point, um, we can actually start to, um, to uh, interrogate um, some of the problems that we were looking at in the last lecture, but I think in a, in a slightly different light. I realized that it's a little bit more cerebral this time. 
Um, but it's still going to be, I think, uh, a much more direct way to, to attack the problem that I was trying to, um, and I think, you know, not doing a great job of in the last lecture. So what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to be swapping the surfaces S and T uh, just for uh, V1 and V2, just so that we know, um, you know, at a glance, which one we're, 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 we're talking about. So it's just a, a quick change in the naming convention here. Um, but doesn't really change the, the the meaning of these expressions at all. Okay, so this was the um, the problem that we were trying to to solve, and that is that um, if you don't want to deal with virtual token balances and you do want to deal exclusive excuse me exclusively with real token balances, this means that we're we are essentially trying to um, drive the uh, this blue curve um, down um, so that it's um, so that at the point that it's running out of X tokens, it's now being driven off the um, the origin point. And when it's running out of um, when it's Y tokens, it will be again beneath the, the axis here. So I think it should be at least visually intuitive that um, you know if we've got some point Y0 and X0 here, and we multiply um, y0 by some constant and x0 by the same constant, that the gradient um, at, at x0, y0 is going to be the same um, as it is at a times y0 and a times x0. And this is uh, something that you are already familiar with um, because you know that the standard hyperbola that we, um, that we have, um, you know, that has been sort of spread throughout DeFi um, the, the way to get the marginal price is just to take the, the, the balance of one of these tokens and divide it by the other. And so if we are, um, if we're taking the partial derivative up here, it doesn't matter what this coefficient is, right? If this is, um, if this is a one in the case of the V1 Bangkok curve, or if this is an A in the case of the V2 Bangkok curve in, you know, the, whatever this leading term is, it just cancels out. And so it's always just going to be, you know, Y zero over X zero in both cases. So these, these lines are parallel and they are tangent um, to, to their curves um, at the, you know, at whatever this um, pivot point is um, where the, uh, the relationship between these two points is just that we have um, sort of amplified one um, by this, this leading A term. So when we pull it back, right? What we're doing is we're choosing this point and we're kind of, pushing these two things together. And there's something that we already know about it. So one is that that point P is going to be common to both curves because we made it so, right? That transformation that we just did by pulling um, this curve down from, um, from its, you know, its amplified or virtualized um, token balances down to its real token balances, because the curve begins with um, X0 and Y0 tokens in it, then this must be the, the point on both curves um, that, you know, where if you were sitting there, you wouldn't know which curve you were on. And, you know, to, to that same point, the, um, the gradient I just, we just saw when we drew those parallel lines is also the same there. So this point is the one that we want. Um, it's the thing that is common to both curves and has the same partial derivative in any dimension. Um, and this gives it amazing, um, you know, uh, not just problem solving power, but also sort of de defining power. Um, you can sort of phrase um, or frame um, the, the amplified curve, the V2 curve, um, in terms of this point um, in a surprising number of, of contexts. And I'm going to show you that in, in just a minute. So um, I'm referring here back to uh, pages 40 to 64 um, of the, the last lecture. Um, but it's not like, you know, I, I'm not expecting you to be able to recall everything that we spoke about there. Just know that I did provide a visual proof um, of, of some of the things that we're discussing. And so I'm going to skip over some of those details just so that we can sort of get um, right to the, the crux of this argument. So um, this was the, the formula that we, um, we wanted to examine. And after some brief rearrangement here, negating the... Um, uh, the parentheses and then gathering like terms so that we end up with a minus one um, as a as a factor uh, means that we can get to what I think is a, a slightly better representation. But this is you know all three of these equations are redundant with each other. <clears throat> okay, so 
now uh, coming back to where we where we left off um, just before we went into some of that formal logic argument, we said that there is this you know product of amplified um, balances is equal to um, whatever the amplification coefficient is multiplied by the product of just the real balances, and that that is equal to capital C. And we've already looked at the fact that capital C is just equal to the amplification coefficient times whatever little c is. So um, we can very easily substitute out some of this stuff because we have an expression now um, from the, the patent itself and from the visual proof that we did um, in, um, in the third lecture where we know that any of these, um, these virtual amplified token balances can be expressed in terms of the amplification coefficient and whatever the real token balance is. So we can get rid of this um, part in the middle and just say that the product of this thing here, which is the, you know, the way to calculate the virtual token balance is equal to A times C. Now this C part, that is this point, right? This bold faced P, the thing that started um, or was the, the point um, common to both curves. And you can express that as being, you know, the, you know, C is the, the the product of all of the things within that um, within that coordinate system within that list of, of points, and so this is the substitution that we do in order to get to the formula that I actually presented you with. And remember, um, I said that gamma is another one of the terms that we use, which is just the inverse of the um, of the amplification coefficient. So this is actually um, a slightly um, more, let's say, a slightly more robust way of arriving at this um, uh, arriving at this expression, or showing you how to um, how to derive it from sort of first principles. Um, and I didn't do it just for the sake of um, of completeness. There are some um, some of these steps that we did, especially the you know the um, the origin point, the pivot point that we're going to be using. Um, in the, the next part of this lecture. So this is the end of the addendum to lecture three. Um, and, uh, you know, for um, just for context, this means that we're, we're done with the, the seminal archetype, uh, which was the, the Bancor V1 formula. Um, we've had a look at nomenclature, conventions and so on. We went through how that works in, in any dimension. And now we've basically completed everything that, that is necessary, I think, um, in terms of, um, of virtual tokens in augmented hyperbolas, or at least um, in the, the context of uh, what we call amplified or, or, or concentrated liquidity. And so with this lecture, what I wanted to do is to, to further explore some of these concepts. Um, there were, uh, I, I think I bit off a little bit more than I could chew in terms of the amount of material that I wanted to cover with, with part four. Um, but I did want to build on, like I like this idea that we kind of take some of the learnings from, from the previous discussion and then continue on and kind of keep adding to stuff. And so while I did want to get into things like curve and, and other things, and we will do that um, later in this lecture, I wanted to go one step further and have a look at um, what you might consider to be an exotic bonding curve, which is Uniswap V3. And more importantly, I wanted to show you that actually you already know what the Uniswap V3 uh, invariant function is because it's the same as the Bancor V2 function. And this is what we're going to do in this part um, because I think that while the bonding curve is the same, the, the you know its expression is certainly unique, right? These, these two equations, look like they don't have very much in common. Um, you know, the Uniswap one has square roots in it, for example, it's got this L term, what is that about? Um, and so I think that there is some value um, to the algebraic manipulation, or at least a demonstration of the algebraic manipulation of these things into different, um, into different forms. Um, and uh, there's more than one reason for this. One is that um, I think that it is uh, helpful to know that if you are implementing a bonding curve in a smart contract, that there are, you know, there are a very large number of redundant um, ways to express exactly the same idea. And this has consequences on things like, um, you know, computation um, resources and, um, you know, memory, the number of variables you have to store and this kind of thing. So the, the, I think this process is going to be valuable as a, you know, a bonding curve research group. Um, so that you guys know that just because there is a formula that someone's published, that there isn't 
you know, a, a better version of it or something like that. Um, and I just think that the exercise is also extremely nourishing to the intellect. Um, so let's start. First, you have to realize that um, with Uniswap, um, just like Uniswap v1 and v2, um, Uniswap v3 is limited to a, a, a two-dimensional um, space, which is um, which is totally fine. This isn't a, a, a limitation or a, um, a shortcoming of Uniswap in any way. This is just a um, like a, a design choice um, that makes you know things like not just the, the smart contracts easier to implement, but also from a product perspective, it makes it easier for users to understand what they're doing. So um, that step that I did there was just to take um, the, just to realize that we've got only two, um, uh, only two dimensions that we need to handle. And so having this large product operator is no, not really necessary anymore. And also that we are only dealing with the case where we're, we've got equal, um, uh, equal reserve weights. Um, and remember, the reserve weights usually have to add up to one, which means that, you know, our X and our Y in this case are both going to be 0 0.5, um, which is where this square root comes from. Um, so if we get rid of that square root by squaring both sides, we end up with an expression like this. No, I'm not going to do the, uh, the 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 tedium here of rearranging this um, uh, equation to uh, to get it in terms of y. This is something that I'll let you do on your own, um, but relatively straightforward to um, to do that. Some of the other expressions that we're going to go over in the next couple of slides, actually, I'm going to show you um, how how it's rearranged. And similarly, I'm not going to show you how to differentiate this, um, but just take my word for it right now that this is the differential. Um, I am. Also, uh, I want you to, to note here that um, in general, there's kind of this um, implicit convention in, um, in DeFi that we always represent the, um, we, well, that we report the gradient um, positive all the time. Um, and this means that whenever you take the, you know, the first derivative of one of these curves, you have to you have to move the the negative sign to the to the other side. Um, so you know we're always talking about an exchange rate, or usually we're talking about an exchange rate. Um, and so people, are, you know, people don't really think of something as having like a negative, um, you know, a negative value. So to say that you know the um, the swap rate of USDC to USDT on curve is negative one. Um, is actually true from a, from a calculus perspective. Um, but in a financial perspective, we, we think of it as being one-to-one, -one, like it's a positive number. Um, so just know that I will um, observe that, um, that convention throughout the rest of this lecture and, and through most of the material that I write. Okay, so um, first time that our, um, our friend P is showing up again. So remember this X zero, Y zero coordinate was the, the thing that we said is common to both curves, right? Um, this expression here. And so every time this thing pops up, if we wanted to, um, you know, for the sake of, um, of, of clarity of presentation or, or something else, we can always feel free to replace this, um, this with the letter C, which remember is actually referring to whatever the hyperbolic constant would be K um, if this was an unamplified curve. Right, so in the, the familiar x, y equals k, um, that k value is equal to this c value. Um, and so it does tell you something about the actual number of, of, of real tokens that there are underpinning this thing. Now, the, uh, the other thing that you'll notice here is that the form that this partial differential takes is, um, is or it should appear quite familiar. Um, in the case that you know we were dealing with, uh, let's say an amplification coefficient of one, right? Um, the uh, then this would uh, you know this part down here would cancel, so it would end up with you know one minus one, so this becomes zero and cancels out this x zero term, and we would end up with just x squared. So one over x squared times c is the familiar um, you know marginal price equation or one of the familiar marginal price equations from um, from like Uniswap v2 and Uniswap v1. So to have it sort of presented this way, I find at least a little bit, um, you know, it, it's kind of deeply satisfying in the sense that um, even though we're, we're kind of in this exotic, um, you know, amplified liquidity space, 
um, the, the same sorts of equations continue popping up. And I just, uh, it's it's just deeply satisfying to, to me to, to see this kind of thing. Okay, so how to use this. What we're going to do is we're going to be examining um, this, um, this uh, X dimension here. So we're always quoting the, um, you know, the, the we're always using an X coordinate here to determine the gradient. So if we have a, um, you know, a, a list of, of possible X values to use, then this means that we can, you know, we can actually decide which points on this curve might be of interest to us. So we know that, um, you know, I'm sorry, this is the, the marginal price, right? So if we have a look at where I've drawn this, this dashed line, um, you can see that uh, it comes up from some X value, it touches the curve at some point. Um, and then, you know, at a, a right angle to that point is where the we, we would have some corresponding Y balance of tokens in the real sense, right? These are both real token balances. And the tangent to the curve at that point is the marginal price. So how do we start? We're going to say that when X is equal to zero, right? At the point where we have uh, some maximum amount of Y tokens and all of our X tokens have been depleted. Um, this is the, um, you know, this is a significant point for us because it is the marginal price at the, you know, at the bound of our um, amplified liquidity curve, right? At the point where it's crossing the Y axis. And so I'm going to, I'm, I choose to call that point um, or the, the gradient at that point, I should say, um, PA. Uh, I think you'll find in the Uniswap documentation, they actually, um, they call this point PB and the other one PA, but it doesn't matter, right? They, they're just symbols. I just like the idea of like reading left to right or even top down. So I feel like A should come before B in this case. Um, but yeah, the, just remember that PA is the steeper gradient. It's the one that's leftmost, right? It's the one that is at the Y intercept when we've got no X tokens left. Okay, what about the next point? Well, if we're getting the, the, uh, the gradient of this curve, right? The, the gradient of the tangent line at the point where the curve is, is leaving the, um, you know, it, 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 it is cutting the Y axis, um, then it would probably be good to also get the gradient at the point where it's cutting the x-axis. The problem here is that we can't just give it x is equal to zero here, um, or we can't give it, you know, y is necessarily equal to zero uh, in the, the straightforward sense because we don't have the, um, the, the partial differential um, expressed in terms of that. Now we could go back and um, you know and just define the um, the derivative in terms of um, of x over y, um, but I'm going to show you a, 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 a something that I think is a little bit more um, you know a little bit more interesting, which is if we go back to the um, the the invariant function that we have in terms of y and set y equal to zero, then necessarily whatever the um, the x coordinate here is um, is going to be that x intercept. So if we rearrange the equation um, to get um, uh, to get rid of all the stuff that we're just going to be either multiplying um, you know by by zero or dividing into zero, we end up with this expression. Um, which means that we can rearrange um, to get something that is relatively compact. Um, and you'll notice that this is also a constant. So if you have, um, you know, at the time that you determine what your bonding curve is going to be, right? When you're giving it these parameters, um, whatever the X zero coordinate is in the amplification coefficient, you already know what the X intercept is. Meaning, you know that if you run out of Y liquidity, um, what the, the X liquidity um, is going to be left inside this curve. And so if we plug that um, point um, into this equation, then we're gonna get uh, another derivative. This time we're gonna call this one PB. So PB is the, the more shallow um, of the two, meaning that um, by, you know, uh, by definition, uh, PA is going to be a larger number than PB. And th this is, again, I, I think a, a more intuitive way to think about things. Okay, 
So um, plugging uh, PA and PB um, into the uh, you know into these uh, into these formulas, um, we end up with these expressions um, here uh, on the top row. All I've done is to take this C term back out, um, which because remember it's just x zero times y zero, which means that we can get rid of part of this x squared, um, which is helpful because now we've got the um, uh, we've got the same um, quotient here of y zero by x zero, um, which is going to be significant in just a, a few moments. So um, what I've done here now is to basically isolate the square root of PA and the square root of PB. Um, if you didn't see that, um, that transformation, let me go back. It's not too difficult. You can see that um, we've got uh, A squared and A minus one squared in both of these expressions. Um, and we already kind of have this light at the end of the tunnel with respect to the, um, the, the uniswapper formula that we're trying to derive. And so we're kind of already expecting that we're going to be taking the square root of PA and PB at some stage. Um, and in a way, this expression here is also kind of pushing us in that direction just because we've already got uh, both the numerator and the denominator squared um, as a result of the algebraic manipulations that we've already completed. Um, so when you're kind of doing these um, things, just know that square roots of things kind of tend to pop up all the time. You shouldn't be afraid of them uh, or feel like you're sort of, you know, meandering down some, um, you know, so some useless factorization method or something, because it turns out that these square roots are just a, a, a very natural um, component of, uh, of hyperbolas in their, um, their algebraic expression. So uh, rearranging these um, uh, equations by, uh, you know, taking the square root of both sides um, gives us these, um, you know, these depictions. Um, and then rearranging these to isolate a minus one um, gives us these expressions. Now you might think that's a really weird thing to do, right? Um, if you were to sort of just blindly be thinking about, um, you know, uh, about how to get a, like a, a better, more intuitive, um, you know, invariant function or something, um, isolating a minus one seems like a, a weird choice. Um, until you realize that the um, the equation that we started with just a few um, just a few slides ago has this a minus one factor already inside it, and that the um, that that factor is being multiplied by the um, the the two components of that coordinate um, that were defining the point that is common to both curves, right? Both the v one and the v two curve. So this x0 and y0 term is kind of the thing that we're trying to cancel out, right? Or that we're trying to get a better perspective on. So we know that these a1 terms are the things that we're going to be sort of moving into this expression that we're going to be substituting out. Um, and then the question is like, which one is going to go where? Because you will note here that uh, while both of these things are, um, you know, have a1 on the left-hand side, the right-hand side is not the same, uh, which is you know, intriguing. So we've got two different definitions for the same um, algebraic identity. And you know, th there are a bunch of things that you could do from here if you really wanted to. For example, you could set um, the right-hand side of this equation equal to the right-hand side of this equation and get some other really interesting properties out. For example, um, you know, what does y0 equal in the context of just these, um, these other things? Right. If you've got a marginal rate um, or the, you know, the, the square root of the marginal rate um, at the point where the, um, the curve is cutting the, the, the y and the x axis, you know, can that tell you something about you know, the other coordinate, x0? Or if you have x0 and y0, what do you know about the, um, what do you know about the marginal rates at the, at the intercepts and so forth? But um, yeah, so here we just need to decide, even though these things aren't the same, which order we're going to substitute them in, right? Wh which one goes where and why? And the thing to look at here, and again, just a, a sort of a, a word of advice, if you're going to be exploring some of these things or some of these concepts on your own, um, again, the uh, don't be afraid of, of things coming out in square roots. So when you see, um, when you have an opportunity to divide some number by its own square root, um, remember that you are always going to get the square root of that number back, right? Two divided by the square root of two is always the square root of two. 
Um, and that can be helpful because now you're kind of going from um, like two different um, like two different variables um, to the same variable. Like it kind of gives you this really nice um, uh, sort of simplification uh, where you end up, you know, where you start off with twice as many terms. And then after doing this kind of, um, you know, after doing these steps, you can end up with uh, fewer, uh, fewer terms than what you started with. So substituting these a minus one terms uh, using the definitions that we derive from the, the marginal price equations above, uh, we end up with these expressions. And again, um, you should be able to very quickly identify that we've got this p term showing up again, which is the, the point that is common to both the v1 and the v2 um, surfaces. Uh, again, just for the, the sake of repetition, Recall that this C term is the, you know, the hyperbolic constant. Um, and if we wanted to, we can substitute out these, um, these X zero, Y zeros just for square root of C in this case. And now we've actually got something that looks pretty familiar. This actually is um, the, the Uniswap V3 uh, invariant function. It's just that instead of expressing, you know, a um, you know, instead of expressing it in terms of the amplification coefficient and, you know, this um, you know this point that's shared on both curves or the you know the hyperbolic um, constant that uh, for the for the unamplified curve, uh, Uniswap has has you know taken these two things together um, and you know created this new um, this new term that they call L, right. So just, you know, I, I think that even by itself, this is a helpful thing to know about the, the Uniswap bonding curve is that, that that L component, like if you read it off of the smart contract, um, it's actually telling you about some, some amount of, um, of amplification um, that has been, you know, done to um, some, some other bonding curve, right? Some smaller bonding curve. So all of the, the, the same intuitions that you've had leading up to this point also apply to Uniswap V3. It's just, it's only in two dimensions and it's only for, um, for equal um, reserve weights. One of the things that is a bit odd um, is that if you try to use um, something like, uh, you know, the, the, the Uniswap invariant um, to define things like a swap equation, you end up with some very difficult um, or, you know, uh, cumbersome um, equations. Um, whereas, you know, the ones that I've shown you for, um, for Bancor V2 were, were relatively compact. Um, the, the Uniswap V3 ones are, 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 are enormous. Now, the reality is that it doesn't matter because both um, the smart contracts in Bancor V2 and the smart contracts in, in Uniswap V3 um, both just use the, the virtual token balances because it's much, much easier to just apply that amplification and then pretend that you're on a normal constant um, constant product bonding curve and just use the, um, the same swap equations that you had there. So it's only under very you know, special situations that you would even want to um, deal specifically with token balances because if you know through this programming hack, um, you could end up in a situation that's much easier to solve than um, you using sort of less um, computer resources resources to um, to solve a swap equation, then you should always be taking um, taking that out, right? You don't always get um, such an elegant way to um, you know to, to to solve a problem. So even though these are the um, you know the the implicit solutions to um, or the implicit swap equations to Uniswap's published invariant, just know that um, you know when you actually do it on the smart contracts, I think they just use the, um, the the virtual token balances anyway. So these equations aren't even used. Um, it's the only it, we're only going through it now just to look at what the um, what the consequences are of of uh, defining your invariant a certain way, and that even if you end up with something that is relatively beautiful, and I think that the um, the invariant that, that Uniswap uses is pretty attractive. Uh, it just, it, it, it's not always the case that you end up with, um, you know, with as elegant or as concise equations when it comes to producing things like um, the swaps or the liquidity provision um, or, or, you know, or, or, or other applications that you might have for it. So it's the end of the Uniswap V3 component to this lecture. 
Um, and I thought that this would be a good opportunity um, to introduce you guys to Carbon, um, only because it is using uh, a very similar, um, uh, a very similar uh, sort of theoretical basis to, to Uniswap v3 and, um, and Bangkok v2. So recall that one of the ways that you can think about amplified liquidity is that um, you, there is you know, some smaller bonding curve that you are emulating um, and you're just, you know, um, you're drawing a little box um, around some section of that curve and you're trading on a much larger curve instead. Um, and we can define that either by the, um, you know, the, the coordinates the, uh, in the middle of this curve, so X zero and Y zero, or we can define it um, at the, um, the marginal rate um, as the curve is leaving the box. So when it's cutting the Y axis, when it's cutting the X axis. Now, um, these amplified curves, they behave exactly the same as unamplified curves in the sense that um, there is one curve to describe all swaps. So if you are on this amplified curve, for example, and you are trading you know, delta X tokens into it and extracting you know, delta Y tokens from it, um, you will do that, you will, you will move the price. Um, and then if uh, someone is, um, let's say less optimistic than you, um, that the, the tokens that you uh, brought out of this curve are worth what you paid, they could um, reverse your transaction in the sense that they can then put the tokens that you took out back into the oh. curve um, and then take out the tokens that you put in. And this is the that reversible nature. This is the thing that, that makes AMM sort of good at what they do um, because the, the market can kind of push and pull um, on, the, on the marginal rates. And that is the sort of mechanism by which AMMs equilibrate to whatever we think that the, you know, the quote unquote market price actually is. But did it have to be that way? And is this, um, is this something that users even want, right? When, when Bank or V1 was designed, it wasn't really, you know, the, the, the user, right? The person that is providing liquidity to the curve in the first place, they did want it because they were the project, right? They were the creator of the token, the, the people that wanted it to equilibrate with the market in a natural way and, and facilitate price discovery as efficiently as possible. But, you know, this idea of a, a community liquidity provider or a, you know, a, a selfishly motivated liquidity provider um, is kind of incompatible with this idea. Um, because the you know the, this this act of constantly re rebalancing the pool and um, you know always being the the de facto counterpart in in every trade that the market wants to take with you, um, it does have you know negative financial ramifications. It's not you know despite the marketing and hype and things, um, adding liquidity to an AMM is is generally not a very good financial decision. And you know, if if someone is going to provide liquidity, they would probably prefer to decide how and um, and at what price points that liquidity is is used. And we know this. Like, I don't think that this is a strong assertion, because um, you know, traders, day traders, do it all the time when they uh, create what you know what we refer to as a limit order, meaning that they will add um, you know they will add some asset to, to an order book and say, you know, this will be um, available to the market when they have an appetite um, to take it from me at the price that I choose. And when the market takes it from them, they don't expect that if the market changes its mind that they are going to be obligated to give the market a refund, um, which is the case on an AMM, right? If someone, this is, this reversibility is essentially, um, you made a trade as the liquidity provider and the market took tokens from you at a price that maybe you wanted. Um, but then um, if the market changes its mind, um, you are then forced to basically give the tokens back in return for the tokens that they took from you. Day traders wouldn't, wouldn't want that. Um, you know, essentially any trader wouldn't want that. This, this is, uh, this is a, an unusual thing to require normal people to, to accept when they are participating in, in financial systems. 
And so um, the solution maybe is to think about what it would mean to have two different bonding curves um, that define trades only in one direction. So that um, the positive delta x minus delta y curve is distinct from the negative delta x positive delta y curve. What do I mean by this? On the, uh, let's say on this blue curve, um, we've got, um, I don't know, let's say in uh, ETH on the, um, you know, this might be an ETH USDC curve, for example. And so someone can be um, pushing one of these assets in, let's say, um, you know, it, it doesn't really matter which one it is, but let's say that they are, um, they are able to uh, put one of these tokens in and in exchange for the other. But if they wanted to, um, to uh, change their mind here and, um, and put the tokens back in, uh, they would have to do it on the other curve, right? So they can't reverse this transaction and or, or, you know, no one else would be able to reverse this transaction for them. Um, the, the person who is creating these curves is literally dictating, uh, mandating that uh, one of these curves is for trading in one direction and the other curve is for trading in the other direction only. What would it look like? I'm gonna pause this for a second. So this is a part of a, a software suite that I've created um, that is for modeling um, AMMs, at least in a, in a, in a financial sense. Um, but there are a couple of heuristics here that I think that you'll find useful. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to compare um, Uniswap V2, Uniswap V3 and Carbon. Um, and the reason we're gonna be doing this is um, at least in the context of our discussion, is looking at how um, you can think about a bonding curve from, um, from a completely different perspective. So um, here you will see that what I have is um, a depth chart. This depth chart in the, which is represented at the bottom left of my screen is what you would get if you were to look at what we've got the price chart um, up here. If you were to take a, a vertical slice of the price chart and sort of look at it from the side on. So at the current market price, whatever the, the, the price of um, this actually is, this is a, an ETH BTC simulation. Um, what you can see is that there's always zero liquidity at, that, at the current price. And this is generally true. Um, and then as we move in one direction um, on the constant product system, you can see that the liquidity is constantly increasing. Um, and this is true in the other direction as well. Now, you know, uh, both from you know, the, the first lecture, but also from um, you know, your guys' general knowledge of DeFi, that a constant product AMM never runs out of liquidity. So these, um, you know, the, this depth chart does, you know, run off into the horizon, um, but it, at a square root profile. So it's a, it still has a finite amount of liquidity. It's just spread over an infinite surface area. So let's run this, um, this animation and see, um, see what it does. So first thing you'll note is that uh, as the price is moving around, you'll see it will kind of push um, on, the, um, on the boundary of this depth chart. And as it does, it's always converting one of these assets into the other asset. Again, you know this. So when, um, when the price is moving up, it's taking our risk asset and converting it into cash and putting that cash immediately behind the, the current market price. So you can see every time the um, this white line moves into the um, into our red liquidity, um, the green curve um, sort of moves up to meet it immediately. And in a in a sense, this is what market makers are supposed to do, right? If you are a, an exchange or if you are a token project, and you are trying to make sure that there is a market for the thing that you are offering. Um, then when you are having a conversation with your market maker, um, one of the things that you are discussing is basically what this liquidity depth profile is going to look like. Um, and market makers also need to um, you know, understand the, 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 the financial risks that they are taking on um, by providing liquidity of a certain profile. And so their appetite for risk and how strong their incentives are to, to participate will determine sort of how healthy that liquidity book looks. 
Um, and so in general, the, um, you know, a healthy, you know, a very liquid system, something like cash, so something like USDC into euros, for example, will have an extremely deep um, uh, depth chart that would require, you know, catastrophic changes in, in price in order to, um, you know, to, to really move the, um, Oh, sorry, it would require catastrophic changes in the market to move the price significantly. Basically, there's so much liquidity around the, the current market price um, that it's very, very difficult for anyone to, to, to move it. Whereas typically things like Bitcoin and Ethereum and so on, um, the, the books are a lot thinner. And so market movements can have much more catastrophic effects on the, on, on the price. Now, there's a, a couple of other things I'm tracking here. Um, and uh, I think for the for the purpose of, 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 of these talks, we don't necessarily need to pay attention to them, um, but just know that the simulation does keep track of the, the financial performance of this portfolio and, you know, it's, it's beaded on the nation and, and so on. Um, but I think for our purposes in the context of, of, of these lectures, we really just want to pay attention to the price chart and the liquidity depth chart so that we can get an idea of, um, of how these different bonding curves re respond to different conditions. The... Um, this is the same simulation, but instead of um, having the depth chart and the fee chart, um, I'm now looking actually at the, um, the bonding curve itself. So as the price is moving up and down, you can see uh, what is, um, what's happening is I'm now using a crosshair to track um, exactly where we are on the, um, the constant product bonding curve. And I've presented it deliberately um, in two different ways. So one is the transpose of the other meaning that if I've got the ETH balance on the y-axis and the BTC balance on the x-axis in the bottom left, then I'm just flipping those in the bottom right. So the BTC balance on the y and the ETH balance on the x. This is going to become a little bit more obvious um, in a, a few slides time as to why um, this is on here, because I realized that it seems stupidly redundant to, to do it. But just realize that when we are, um, when we are watching these market movements occur, that any change that we're seeing in um, one of these charts on the bottom left has some sort of you know, reciprocal um, motion in the chart on the right, um, at least on Uniswap V2 and Uniswap V3. Meaning that essentially these are the same chart, um, I think is the, the best way to say it. Um, the, 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 the purchase um, or sale of, of one token on one of these charts is the same as looking at it from the, the, the transpose perspective on the other chart. Doesn't really matter which, which one of these um, graphs you're on, you already have enough information on one of these to construct the other. Let's have a look at Uniswap V3. So the first thing you'll note, and I'll pause this, oops. The first thing you should note here we are. So the first thing you should note here is that we are no longer enumerating the liquidity from a zero price point to an infinite price point like we were on the typical constant product. So remember, um, just you know, a handful of slides ago, we actually showed that um, you know, when the real X token um, balance is zero, we can measure a marginal rate, right? When, you know, when we've run out of that liquidity. And then by setting, you know, the X to its X intercept, we were able to measure the, um, the marginal rate um, as the Y token is running out of liquidity. And so that's what we've effectively got here. Um, the, the bottom of this range, of this green range, is, um, you know, let's call that uh, P, that'll be P, um, PA or PB, depending on um, which, which one of these assets you're using as numera. Um, and then the other one would be you know, PA or PB, whichever the, the opposite is. Um, and what you will also see, and this is something that I really wanted to, to, to address in these lectures, but we never actually got to, is that there is this, um, this gap between the, the green band and the red band. And this is because, because of the fee, um, you're effectively looking at, uh, you're, there's a part of the bonding curve that's effectively removed. Um, and so the, there's a discontinuity um, between, um, uh, between the, the, the marginal rates, but that's again, something else we, we might be able to explore in a, in a lecture in the future. Long story short, there is a, a, now a, 
a, a limited range of marginal rates that we are um, you know, going to be executing over. Um, but everything else is pretty much the same. And I'm just realizing now that this is actually the, uh, let's do the depth chart one first. So same simulation, same price chart. Um, so as it moves around, it's doing exactly the same things that it, that it did in the Uniswap V2 case. Every time the, um, the price moves up, we are going to be consuming some of our, um, our risk liquidity, in this case, Bitcoin, um, and converting it into ETH. Um, and the ETH appears again beneath the um, beneath the current market price. And when this um, when this chart eventually turns around, um, you're going to see that as it moves through our cash liquidity, which in this case is ETH, um, it is converted into Bitcoin, and that Bitcoin it appears immediately behind um, the whatever the current market rate is. So this is that example right now. So let's pause it right there, um, where I said that if you are um, if you're in a concentrated liquidity system and Uniswap v3 is a concentrated liquidity system, it's possible to completely run out of liquidity. So here, um, as long as the price of Bitcoin is all the way up um, above our range, we only have ETH tokens. So this is, you know, the the, the case where, um, you know, either we're at the X intercept or we're at the Y intercept, and we're still quoting a marginal price at whatever this bound to be. But in fact, the market rate is something else entirely. So when we have no, you know, when we have only one token left, we actually lose the ability um, to to quote an accurate market price anymore. And this is one of the trade offs of having a, a concentrated liquidity system. But um, the you know competition for um, you know for for trading volume means that there's generally liquidity to all price points on on something like Uniswap V3. Um, and even if um, you know retail users aren't doing it. Um, Uniswap and their and their partners uh, seem to be uh, capable of, um, of of bringing liquidity into the system to to maintain it over um, long periods of time. Anyway, um, okay, so that's the the depth chart component. You'll see that it, this is a little bit more chaotic as well, um, but this is again just because we're zoomed up on such a small part of the the bonding curve um, that small changes in the price have a, a much more dramatic effect in terms of um, in terms of price. Okay, so the invariant function looks, um, again, pretty similar to what it looked like for Uniswap v2. So these aren't triangles. Um, the, this actually is, uh, this does have a very slight curve to it. Um, and again, the, um, you know, the, the, marginal, uh, the marginal price at the, at the end here is whatever um, the marginal price um, on, the, um, on the price chart says it is. So you can see here that um, the bottom of my green range is at about 13 point something. Um, and so the, um, you know, the, the marginal rate of the, um, of the curve as it's leaving, um, uh, you know, as it's becoming depleted of one asset is also going to be 13. Um, and, and the reciprocal will be true in the other, uh, for the other asset. But again, um, these are the transpose of each other. And so uh, whenever, you know, one of these um, triangles is, is responding, um, the other one is doing the, the, the same thing, but in the, from the opposite perspective. So if I um, wait for the price to come back in, here we are. You can see that um, on the left, uh, where we've got the ETH uh, balance on the, on the y-axis and the BTC balance on the x-axis, the small red triangle here is a, um, a graphical representation of the amount of liquidity or the, the depth of liquidity that we have left in Bitcoin. Um, and if you have a look at the price chart, you can see just visually um, that it, that's easy to confirm, right? Because the, the price of BTC is currently moving up through that range. And so the difference between where the current market price is and the edge of, um, the edge of our liquidity bound is, uh, is relatively small for Bitcoin and relatively high for Ethereum. And so we would expect that the amount of ETH liquidity that we have to be comparably uh, large compared to the amount of Bitcoin liquidity that we've got left. And that's true on both of these charts. Um, and again, this is just uh, a redundant way, uh, maybe over, overly repetitive of showing you that these two charts are like, they, there is a symmetry here. They are effectively the same chart. Um, and this is a key takeaway because carbon isn't. So this is, remember, the, the two different bonding curves um, that I said we're using to, to change the, the way that things trade. 
So um, first thing to note here, and I've paused it, is that as the price of Bitcoin is coming down through this range, we're getting, uh, you know, we're depleting our ETH liquidity. Um, and again, nothing too shocking there. Um, this is, uh, I guess, you know, a property that, you know, Carbon shares with something like Uniswap v3, for example. But the bids um, are not coming down to meet the market price. So for the first time, we're seeing this kind of gray region um, start to uh, start to appear that wasn't present in either of the other simulations. Um, and this will be, um, you know, this will be maintained. So you can see um, on the depth chart, we've basically almost completely run out of um, out of Ethereum, and our Bitcoin wedge is now quite large. Um, and here, um, as the price of Bitcoin went up, we're now trading on the other bonding curve. Right, so the the market then has an appetite to to take BTC from us at a completely different price point, and so we gave it to them. And when um, that BTC was sold for ETH, rather than the ETH coming back into the same bonding curve that we were selling BTC on, that ETH is now going to the other bonding curve that we were selling ETH on. And this is the thing that makes Carbon's bonding curve so special: is that they aren't n-dimensional; they are one-dimensional. They only have their own token on them. And this means that you can compose them together um, you know, as many times as you want um, to create, um, you know, to create an n-dimensional bonding curve if you want one. So here, for example, we've obviously created um, from two bonding curves a two-dimensional um, system, but one that lets us choose the, um, the marginal rates that we trade at independently um, of each other's balances. One of the ways that I've just described this, um, for example, when I was in ECC, is that um, up until we, uh, up until the advent of carbon, um, all of the bonding curves that we use throughout DeFi are explicitly using the balance of another token to quote the price of, of, an, uh, of a, a token other than that one. Um, for example, if you've got a, you know, an ETH USDC curve, you kind of use the balance of USDC to quote the price of ETH um, or use the balance of ETH to quote the price of USDC and so on. Um, with carbon, you don't do that. You, you use the balance of ETH to quote the price of ETH and you use the balance of USDC to quote the price of USDC only. Um, they don't even know about each other's balances, which is, which is pretty interesting. Um, on the um, invariant side, again, you will see, oops, just a ping space bar. Um, you'll see on the invariant side, again, straight away, that these things are starting to look a bit different to, um, to what we're used to. So uh, for the first time, in, at least in the, the three simulations that I've shown you, we now have an example where um, where what's happening in the bottom left of, um, of this presentation is different to what's happening in the bottom right. And so as I let that play out, you can see that again, this is just a, a different graphical representation of what we're seeing on the price chart. Um, but the uh, essentially there is no BTC balance in the, um, in the ETH pool and there is no ETH balance in the BTC pool. There is only one token in each. So this big gray, you know, uh, chasm that's appearing for for ETH um, is kind of it's representing a void, right? That we used to um, in the you know in the old paradigm um, just let be populated by the other token of the pair. But what we're saying in carbon is just let it be unpopulated. You don't need to have another dimension there. It's okay to have a one-dimensional curve. Um, which I know it sounds counterintuitive, like how do you even visualize a one-dimensional curve? Um, and you'll see, um, you know, I've actually labeled the x-axis in both of these um, in both of these plots the uh, the fictional x-coordinate, and it is because to have a bonding curve at all in the traditional sense in 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 Carbon's context um, is uh, requires you to perform um, an integration which means that you kind of get, um, you get back a dimension that wasn't there before. So the, um, the, the X axis in both of these, um, in both of these animations is just the shadow of that integration. 
it's not a, a token balance. And this is the, the first example in DeFi of, um, of a bonding curve being constructed this way. Um, so other than that, um, I think, um, you know, the, you know, once you've wrapped your head around that concept, the, the rest of what you're seeing here should, um, should make uh, more sense. Um, but yeah, this is a, a dramatically different way of, of thinking about concentrated liquidity and, um, and uh, you know, the, the way that it can be used to create different, um, different things. Obviously, as a, you know, a DeFi product, um, you know, our, our focus is always on, you know, trying to either, you know, support projects and, and their liquidity needs, or in, in, in the case of carbon, support people that are um, wanting to um, engage in, you know, in, in, in financial markets for selfish reasons. Um, and so carbon is really the product for them, um, for the latter case, whereas Bancor V1 and even Bancor V2 to some extent um, was mostly for the former case, right, for supporting projects. Um, just quickly, um, you can have a look at, there's like a Bloomberg sort of style uh, way that we can sort of capture the, the differences in, um, in, in the way that these different uh, bonding curves behave. Um, and this is again, just having a look at that same simulation um, and what we're, uh, you know, the, 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 the thing that you ought to be paying attention to here is the difference between the blue and the yellow curves. Um, so the blue line here, the blue trace, is the, the portfolio valuation, meaning the, the LP position inside this, um, you know, inside these systems. Um, whenever it is above the yellow line, then we say that this is in a, a state of impermanent gain. And whenever the blue line is below the yellow line, we say it's in a state of impermanent loss. So Uniswap V2 over the, the um, this particular simulation, I didn't, didn't do too bad. I think it's about a, a 1%, um, you know, 1% gain. Uh, Uniswap V3 is kind of showing us what it's made of because it, it did perform much better. Um, but if you were paying attention during the animation, you would have noted that um, it's not without risk. Um, I think the, the, the biggest capitulation that we saw in, um, in the Uniswap V2 case was I think negative 4%. It might not have even been that high. Um, I think actually it might have even been negative 1.4%. I can't remember now. Um, whereas for Uniswap V3, it was something like 15% uh, capitulation, which is much more aggressive. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, after the price of, of Bitcoin came back into range, um, you know, the, the 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 profits that you get from a concentrated system can be significantly um, higher than the the unconcentrated one. Um, I think it's something like a 15% return as opposed to 1.4 or something like that. Um, but carbon, um, because of uh, the, the ability of it to hold on to uh, value for longer, right? Wait for better prices, both when you're buying something, so um, or, you know, refusing to exchange your cash for the risk asset until it, um, it's an attractive price. Um, and similarly on the upside, re refusing to exchange your, um, your risk asset back to cash um, until it's valuable enough um, means that it accrues value um, actually in a, a, a much more dramatic way. Um, and, and this shouldn't be too surprising uh, because it's no longer um, strictly speaking sort of a, a short gamma protocol, um, but it's something that's much more akin to sort of alpha generation or much more aligned with, with, um, with alpha generation. We tend to throw around terms like, um, like buy low, sell high and that type of thing. But I think that's how it's, it's a little bit lame, I think in, in some situations. Um, the, the, the better way to think of it is just that you are, um, you know, rather than chasing the market for volume, you're instead um, deciding your price targets and waiting for the market to come to you. Um, so it's a, a, a slightly different way to think about um, bonding curves. And I think for the, um, for the first time in a DeFi context, um, no longer using them for market making, right? A carbon is not an AMM. It is a trading protocol, so it will become illiquid. It does become illiquid fairly frequently, um, the same way that a lot of markets will become illiquid if you only allow people who want to interact with them interact with them. Um, so yeah, the the, the summary. Um, there are some things that I wanted to show you. If you want to get um, further into the weeds, um, and I, I do recommend that you do. If you come to our website, um, right at the bottom under resources, 
you'll see that we've got um, the light paper, white paper, GitHub, a simulator repo, which is not the one that I showed you today, but one that is similar. Um, the, um, the, the white paper was authored by myself and Stefan Loesch. And I think if I can move this, here we are. Um, and it's, uh, I, I think that it's of um, a, a pretty good caliber. Um, the light paper is mostly meant for sort of um, like marketing purposes, like threaders and things on, on, on Twitter. Um, it has the advantage of being a lot shorter, um, but it's not nearly as in depth. Um, but one of the things that I, I wanted to, um, to show to you guys uh, and something that I, I don't show to, to everyone. Um, and again, this is the, um, where is it? Should be here. Um, maybe we removed it. All right, I will, um, I'll just send this to, um, to Rabbit so that he can give it to you guys. It used to be up on a website. I'll have to find out where it is. Um, but this is our invention disclosure. So this is um, uh, basically what I sent to the, the patent office um, prior to um, publishing um, Carbon. So, you know, Bancor tends to collect um, intellectual property. Um, and so we've basically had our, we had our provisional awarded in October of last year, and we've recently filed for the, um, the PTC. Um, but this has um, an enormous amount of, of work in it that I think that you will find um, of interest. So for example, um, these are um, various ways that you can list um, the invariant function for a concentrated curve in, um, in two dimensions only with equal weights. So you saw already that there was like, you know, the bank or B2 formula, which was uh, essentially this one here where N is substituting for gamma. Um, and then I showed you that we can turn that into the Uniswap B3 formula. Um, and here are like a dozen other, you know, invariant functions that you might use. Um, some even using um, constants that you haven't seen before, things like Q. Um, and what's more special is that um, some of the, um, you know, some of the equations that I've deduced here, um, let's move to the swap equation. So for example, some of these swap equations, they, um, they only reference one coordinate system. So in general, um, you know, if I if I zoom back up, um, in the the typical case, um, so if we were you know performing a swap on um, on something like um, like Uniswap V two, uh, you would probably be used to seeing um, yeah something like this swap equation, either in terms of k or or in terms of um, x and y. But the point is, is that it will have both of these coordinates in it. Whereas the swap equations that I've provided um, in this invention disclosure, um, again, referencing the one dimensionality of Carbon's curves will only refer to one of the token balances. So here, for example, if this was an amount of ETH that's being extracted from a curve for a, um, an amount of USDC that is put into it, you'll note that all of this input space um, only has the X coordinate in it. There is no reference to a Y coordinate. Um, and that's true all the way down here. Um, and if you, you know, if you integrate these things, you can kind of get back to a, a Y coordinate if you, if you wanted one, um, but the value comes from not having one at all. Um, there are also some of the, um, you know, a lot of the, the geometric um, like uh, intuition um, has kind of been, um, you know, very thoroughly fleshed out in this document. And so I think that it's a really good place to start. Um, and the other thing that it has is um, a bunch of um, identities. So let me just have a look, here we are. So um, in some of the, the homework um, that I've given you previously, I've noted that, you know, we might want to, you know, can you define the intercept in terms of X0 and Y0? Or can you define the, you know, the asymptote in terms of the marginal price equation or something like that? And so here I've got like a, a very long, um, a, a very long list of these identities that actually show you how to convert between all of these different aspects of a concentrated liquidity curve. Um, and some of them are pretty surprising. Um, so for example, I don't know, um, like this, uh, the Y0 coordinate can be expressed in terms of, you know, PA, the, 
excuse me, the, the um, hyperbolic constant and the, um, you know, the amplification coefficient, for example. Um, so yeah, I think uh, if you really wanted to get um, really deep uh, into concentrated liquidity expressions, um, the, the invention disclosure is, is absolutely um, the, the best place to, um, I, I think is one of the, the best resources um, available for doing that. Okay. Okay, that's the end of, um, of carbon, but not of the lecture. Um, as, um, as promised, I do wanna go over um, the stablecoin curves. And I have um, prepared, a, um, I prepared a, a bunch of different um, Desmos um, graphical, you know, uh, graphing calculator uh, exercises that we can go through them or demonstrations, I should say. Um, but unfortunately, uh, because of, uh, I, I had to spend so much time preparing um, for, and, you know, in meetings and things in Europe, um, I wasn't able to commit as much time as I wanted to um, to developing out the these slides. So it's basically going to be this slide plus the the Desmos demonstrations and um, whatever I say about them off the cuff. But these are the two expressions that I wanted to show you. One of them is um, is well known, which is the curve V one. Um, this is the I, I I've, I've modified it a little bit from the way that it appeared in its first white paper by um, Michael Ogarov, but it's it's known. Um, the solidly one that I'm providing here, um, you actually would not have seen before because it doesn't exist anywhere, not even in um, the solidly documents. Um, the, uh, we'll look at the, the exact instance um, that Andre Cronier used of this formula. And I speculate that he probably does have the general formula himself somewhere, but he's never shared it with anyone. Um, and so I'm going to share it with you so we can investigate some of its properties. And then we will have a look at probably at, at we will speculate together um, on why um, he went with exactly the, the form of it that he did. Um, so just know um, that this expression is, you know, I, I don't know if it's a secret or, or something, or it's just something that, um, you know, no one thought to, to share with anyone. Um, but this is a, um, yeah, this is a, a, a rare site. Um, you, you can't find it on the internet or anything like that. Now, um, there's a couple of terms here that we need to discuss. The first one is, um, is this letter D. So um, the, the curve white paper does a very good job um, of, uh, of defining it. Um, and it is, it's quite distinct from the hyperbolic constant like K or C in the case of, of the lectures that I've given you. D is defined as being the total number of tokens that exist in a liquidity pool when they all have the same marginal rate with respect to each other. So imagine on a, um, like a, a USDC, USDT pool, at exactly the point where um, USDC and USDT have an, a one-to-one -one exchange rate, exactly one-to-one -one exchange rate. So for example, if you put 100 USDC and 100 USDT into a liquidity pool, into a standard constant product liquidity pool, we know that K, in the case of Uniswap V1 and Uniswap V2, would be 100 times 100, so 10,000, um, but D would be 200, right? It would be the sum of the, the tokens in that, um, in that pool. And uh, D has the same meaning in the in the solidly formula, um, but again, the the way that it is expressed um, in its own documentation and certainly in its smart contracts, um, it, it uses a different variable. But just know that it's uh, it, it doesn't really matter. You, you can convert between the the hyperbolic and the um, the constant sum um, constants without too much um, without too much issue. Okay, so let's go to Desmos. First one we're going to look at is um, is the curve um, the the curve version. You guys can just confirm for me that you can see a um, uh, my my graphing calculator up in front of you. Yeah, we can see it. Perfect. Okay, so um, you can see here. I've just pro. This is the the way that it appears in the curve white paper, um, and I've got a couple of different variables here that we can play with. So D in this case, um, when we when we move it around, it's going to have the same effect of changing the you know the K value of uh, of a hyperbola. 
Um, so, you know, it, it basically just moves it in and out of the, um, of the origin or like moves it closer towards the origin at low D values and farther from the origin at higher D values. Um, but this A term is the thing that's really interesting. So you can see when we, um, when we move it around, we get this really spectacular sort of, um, you know, shape um, developing. And the way to think about it is exactly the same um, as the context that I raised it in Bangkok V2, is that it is like the amplification coefficient. The difference is that in Bangkok V2, um, when A is one, it's equal to um, the, the constant product case. But in Curve's case, it has to be equal to zero. Um, and as we move up, you'll see that it takes on this, this strange kind of squashed shape. So when we start, um, we start at zero, it's this you know, beautiful conic section. And then as A increases, it like flattens out towards the middle. Um, but maintains this, um, you know, this asymptotic approach um, to both the y-axis and the x-axis on either side. Um, okay, so how do we, you know, is there, maybe there's another way that we can sort of um, have a look at that, that transformation. Um, the first one is to have a look at um, where the constant sum curve is. So x plus y equal to, is equal to d. So again, I can show you that as we move D around, we're also going to be moving that constant sum line around. And as we, uh, you know, as we squash this thing down, you can see it really is getting closer and closer to this line. Um, and if we, you know, if I set um, A to B, have a higher tolerance, maybe up at 100, you can see that as I drive it farther and farther um, to the edge, that it actually does start to look more and more like a straight line in the middle. Um, and we have to really get all the way down here to even see that it's, um, you know, uh, that there's any, uh, that, that, you know, it's tapering off at all, right? At this, at this scale, it really does look like it's just a completely straight line. And this is advantageous for a couple of reasons. Um, the thing that makes Curve such a, a, such a successful protocol is that it actually solves, um, this is rare in DeFi, it actually solves a problem that people were having which is that um, stablecoin liquidity um, is, is only valuable if you're able to, uh, to exchange something like USDC for USDT at an approximate one-to-one -one rate uh, and in very large amounts. Um, and the, the reason is simple, is that we expect USDC and USDT to be worth about the same um, you know, all the time. When you're trying to trade on a, um, on a hyperbola though, you actually can't trade anything um, without moving the price quite significantly. Um, and so this ability to flatten it out and have a much more gentle um, change in, um, you know, change in the gradient, so essentially a, a much more gentle second derivative um, means that you can use very, very large amounts of, um, you know, of the liquidity that you have before you start to see a, a change in its price. Um, and this is, I think, a, a really, you know, it, it, it is a really great idea. This is one of the, the DeFi protocols that I think deserves our respect. It was a, uh, not only is the, you know, the mathematics, but that the, the sits behind this thing, it's unique, right? This is in no way, um, you know, this doesn't have anything to do with Bancor at all, right? It's not um, Bancor V1, it's not Bancor V2, it's completely novel. Um, and that's that's rare. And, and I think that, you know, like I said, it, it deserves our respect. Um, but it does have problems. One of them is that um, you'll see that there's no obvious way that we can change, for example, the incline, right? So it could be that we want something that has a, you know, a relatively stable uh, rate of exchange, but not one-to-one. -one. Um, of course, for... Um, for USDC and USDT and things like that, of course, it's going to be one to one forever. But you know, you can imagine um, some other application, maybe a, a non financial application, where you would want the um, exchange rate to remain relatively stable at some other at some other rate, maybe two or three or pi or or whatever you want it to be. No, at least no um, no immediately obvious way 
um, to achieve that with this function. The other one is that um, the swap equations can are notoriously difficult to solve. Um, and I'll, I'm actually working on, um, I'm actually completing some work um, now on um, how to, you know, how to arbitrage curve with, um, with arbitrary precision. Um, and so maybe later on, I'll, I'll share with you, with you guys some of the swap equations um, and, and other things, but I haven't completed that work yet. So it, it seems premature. But just know that the equations uh, like the to solve for the swap and things are, are, are not very trivial. Um, and uh, to implement them in a smart contract is also extremely challenging. Uh, and again, um, testament to, um, to, to Ergarov's um, intelligence, uh, he's implemented, I think, a, um, a, a fairly fast newton rapston method um, that doesn't solve the, the swap um, symbolically, but rather um, approaches, you know, a um, the right output um, after I think four or five iterations. Um, the curve contracts actually run it a very large number of times, like thirty two or sixty four or something. I can't remember. Um, I think for the the sake of security, um, but realistically, I think that um, they almost always end up solved after like three or four. Okay. Um, so the, the only other thing that we need to, to look at here is the N parameter, um, which always refers to the number of tokens um, or the number of different token types. So it's the same N that you've seen um, in like the, our, um, our big operator um, uh, nomenclature. Um, so if there's only two tokens in the pool, like USDT and USDC, then N is equal to two. Um, if there's three, for example, if you add die to it to form the triple, um, then n would be three and so on. Um, and now we can't, I don't know if Desmos will actually let me graph in three dimensions, um, but it's worth just looking at what happens when we move this thing around. Because um, it's it, it might not be, uh, you know, it, it, it could be that this isn't what you expected. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure necessarily sure what I would have expected, um, but uh, I can confirm that if you uh, if you go ahead and add other dimensions to this thing, um, it's really really important um, to 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 correctly adjust for this n parameter, or when you start moving the amplification around, you will actually lose adherence to this kind of one to one point. Um, if you like the x zero y zero point um, on um, on the the curve equation. Um, so that is, um, that's curve V1. So is it, is it brilliant? Yes. Right. Um, did it actually solve a problem that the industry was having? Absolutely. Um, and is it general? Yeah. You can put a, you can put any number of dimensions into this thing and it will have, uh, it will have this property, um, you know, in, in all of those dimensions. So it's, it's, it's really very, very nice. What are the problems? Um, it's not a trivial function to solve for, for swaps. Um, and it lacks the flexibility to give us a, a slope um, of anything other than minus one, I think. Um, it could be if we ask Michael, he might say, yeah, look, there's a way that you can, you know, add a new parameter into here and, and get it to slope a different direction. But I have been unsuccessful uh, myself in, in, in realizing that in a, you know, in, in a... Um, let's say a, um, a pragmatic sense, right? And something that you could actually implement on a smart contract. Okay, let's have a look at Solidly. So Solidly is um, sort of similar um, in that uh, it's, 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 it's more similar to um, Bancor V2, I think, in the sense that when, um, yeah, when uh, you, you use its, version of the amplification coefficient, which in this case is R. And you can see here, it's these things, um, you know, it's what it, X and Y are raised to. And when I take this whole thing, I also um, have to take the root um, at R plus one. Um, but when it's equal to one, um, you get again, just the, the normal um, hyperbola. So um, let's have a look at what happens when we move R down to numbers less than one. You will see that it looks to be doing something very, very similar to curve, right? It gets flatter towards this middle section. And in fact, when R is equal to zero, it becomes a completely straight line, which is something that only happens um, in the, the curve equation when you allow A to become infinite. 
So um, the, the solidly equation actually can get to a, an, 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 infinitely, um, an infinitely amplified system. Um, and at all numbers between zero and one, um, you get this kind of slope, you know, the, the same sort of slope that you get for, um, for uh, you know, for, for curve V1. But what do you think happens? And this is like, you know, something that I'm gonna ask for your intuition on. What do you think will happen when I make R a number greater than one, right? If it's getting sort of, you know, stretchy, stretchy and, um, you know, forming a, a nearly flat line around uh, a gradient of one to one, in the middle between zero and one, and still forms this this asymptote at um, at x and y. What do you think will happen when r is greater than one? Does anyone have an intuition for it? Would it surprise you that it does the same thing? So between zero and one, we still get this flattening and above one, it also flattens out. And when we get to three is actually when it's at its flattest. And after three, it starts to do this. So this is a really weird invariant function. And it's actually not, uh, you know, at, at numbers greater than three, I would say it's actually completely useless. So when um, Andre Cronier was, I think, looking at how to implement these things, the one that he went with was R is equal to exactly three. So what you're looking at here is um, essentially when this pivot point, which starts to form at, at numbers higher than three, when it becomes completely flat. And this is also nice because it means that you're dealing with an integer power. Um, so if you're doing sort of fast solutions or something in solidity, um, then you know it's not you know it's not outside of the realm of what is reasonable um, to be able to solve for you know a swap equation or something like this. Whereas if we're using um, numbers you know less than less than one then kind of fractional powers like this is, is, is more problematic. And you'd probably have to, you know, create some, um, you know, uh, uh, some series um, to, to approximate the answer or something, and it gets more and more numerically unstable. Okay, so let's then ask the question, um, how similar are these things? I'm gonna start, um, I'm gonna turn the curve one back on, and I'm gonna start them both. Um, at zero, right? So we, we know that there are solutions to both of these invariants that are exactly hyperbolas. Um, and we know that as I you know drive A to a higher value on the, on the curve function, that it gets flatter and flatter in the middle and forms an asymptote to the side. Um, and then the question is, what does the solidly function do, right? If it's behaving in a similar way, like how similar is similar? Like can I make them equal to each other? And the answer is you can't. These are like, there will never be, um, uh, you know, a, uh, a number here that gives you um, the same curve on both of these, um, on both of these functions. Um, which is, I don't know, like if you think that that's a, a surprising result or an unsurprising result, I guess is, a, is dependent on your, um, um, your, uh, you know, your, your previous experiences and so on. Um, but to me, I thought that that was, uh, you know, I, I wasn't sure what I was expecting, um, but, you know, I, I wasn't expecting it to be so obvious, I suppose. I thought that it might be the sort of thing where, you know, uh, the, uh, the relative difference between these two curves, you know, is exaggerated at some extreme or something, but you can see that these are like perfectly obvious. The gaps between these curves are, are um, you know, are, are are, are totally apparent um, and um, you know trying to get these things to to, to meet up is just a, a fool's errand. Okay so um, that's those two expressions um, and just for for good measure um, the um, this Desmos have also got the you know the straight line and the um, the normal constant product one in there as well. Okay so I didn't want to end it there. 
uh, because I've actually uh, spent a lot of time working on these things um, myself. So uh, not, I, not many people know this, but the, um, when I first picked up my contract at, at Bancor as a researcher, the, the, my first task um, was to develop a, a product that would compete with, with Curve, right? Was to develop something that was attractive for stablecoin liquidity in the same, um, in the same sense that Curves was. And um, I, I have never really stopped working on it. Um, it's something that I like to come back to because, you know, I, I do think that um, there might be, I don't want to say something better because, you know, it makes it seem like, um, you know, that what Michael has done or what Andre has done are, are somehow, you know, unsatisfactory or something, which they're not, they're, they're totally satisfactory. That even just from an academic standpoint or a scientific standpoint, I think that there is, you know, there is more room um, on, on stable coin curves to find things that have more attractive properties, where whether it be a more numerically stable, um, you know, uh, invariant or, um, you know, something that has a, an easier price quote function or an easier swap function. There's just things that, that we might be able to do. Um, okay, and so what I wanted to show you um, was my attempts at, um, at doing that. Um, so, um, here, uh, if I take away, um, if I take away everything except the, the curve stable swap invariant, um, you can see that, um, you know, what this, what the, the general profile looks like. And when I was looking at this, the, the first time back in 2021, um, I noticed that it kind of has this double hyperbola type structure. So, you know, towards the, um, you know, the x-axis, you can kind of imagine that, you know, this, you know, these two curves, um, you know, might be a part of one cone section. And then these two curves might be a part of another cone section. And then, of course, you've got another one down here. And I was thinking, you know, if I could just create an equation that kind of draws two hyperbolas that meet exactly in the middle, then there would be, um, you know, there might be something there that is, um, that, that has a, a, you know, a simple, um, a simple solution um, that might mean that, you know, solving the swap equation might not be as gas heavy, for example. Um, and this is, um, you know, this is exactly what that result was. And so you can see it's got a lot of the same properties um, that the, some of these other curves have. I can change the, um, the relative um, curvature, I can change the, the size the same way that you can on curve. Um, but the other thing you'll note is that it takes two equations to do it. Um, so yeah, you can see here is, um, you know, as you move these things around, you can definitely see sort of where my head was at in terms of, you know, at least defining the curvature of these things and making sure that they have um, a point um, somewhere on the, the invariant that gives the, the, same, um, the same gradient at the same point. Um, but it also means that you have to implement it as a piecewise function. Um, and that's what I've done here. So again, uh, this is the, the, same, um, the same equation as the one that I just shown you, um, except that I'm only, plotting, um, uh, I'm only plotting one of the equations right of a certain value and I'm uh, plotting the other equation to the left of that value. Um, and so it gives me the same, um, the same sorts of properties, but where this stable equation differs from um, its competitors is that I can change its, um, its relative slope. So in the, the curve B1 stable and in the um, solid, solidly stable, you can only achieve one-to-one -one swap rates. Um, but in this case, um, we can create um, sort of arbitrary, um, you know, uh, you know, arbitrary stable swap rates at uh, at any rate. Um, and again, this is something that I would be, um, you know, happy to to share with you. Um, I think probably all of these um, desmoses will be um, included um, in a, an email that I'll send to Rabbit, um, so that if you wanted to explore these on your own, then you're welcome to do that. Um, but I think that that's where I wanted to end. Um, that's where I wanted to end everything. Um, I I hope that um, that you've enjoyed 
um, you know, all of the conversations that we've had together. And um, yeah, I um, I thank you all for your attention, and um, I'm looking forward to um, to seeing what you guys do with uh, with the material. Thanks so much, Mark. Amazing presentation. Um, tons of detail. Uh, also, really excited to see, and I really love the way you laid out the the dashboards and and show the difference between the um, two. Uh, two linked assets in a curve versus the two um, assets separate in in the carbon pools. I never, you know, I've read through the documentation, but that that visualization was just, uh, you know, in, incredible. I'm really curious what tool you use to put together your slides as well, because these are like, man, top notch. They're like lecture lecture quality. It's incredible. Thank you. Yeah, honestly, the slides I'm just putting together with um, with PowerPoint. PowerPoint these days is extremely powerful. They're learning from um, Keynote, is it? The uh, Mac uh, presentation app always seemed to be light years ahead, but glad to hear uh, PowerPoint's keeping up. <laughs> awesome stuff. Um, any any other questions? I know, I guess we went quite a bit over, but I, you know, just was digesting all that info. Um, yeah, and curious if there's any of those resources that you're happy to share. You mentioned the um, uh, yeah. the uh, patent application and uh, yeah, great to see all of those invariants listed out um, or invariant derivations, I suppose. Um, I'm curious if any of the other, um, yeah, either your your um, Desmos file or, uh, oh, yeah. just, oh, no, there. Uh, well, Mike's got a question. This. So, this, so this is, um... This is something else that I'll share with you guys. So uh, I'm I'm currently in the process of productizing this, um, but this is a basically um, th th this is all of the information that you would probably ever want to know about um, um, about you know constant product um, bonding curves and concentrated bonding curves. And so I've put this all into like a, a single package um, that we can use to sort of investigate. Um, how different AMMs perform under different conditions. So for example, um, if we were to look at um, two assets, let's look at compound and Aave, for example, let's say uh, for the last year. So what I'm doing here is I've constructed an API call um, to three different um, data sources. So I've got API keys, both to crypto compare, CoinGecko and, um, and CoinMarketCap. Um, and, you know, the uh, the thing that, that, that this lets me do is fetch uh, fetch data at you know at any frequency. So I can do minute, hour, or day. Um, minute I think is only stored for the last seven days, um, but whatever. Um, and um, what I'm what it does is it will pull them in the same numera, so usually USD, um, and then it stitches them together so that you can get you know a candlestick chart for any asset versus any other asset. Um, and then after that, you can simulate, um, you know, what a, um, you know, one of these would have been this around. So something like this, for example, um, we can choose for Uniswap. Um, we can also choose different ranges for carbon. So like, you know, we can move these things around and, and decide what these things are going to be looking like. Um, there are a couple of other things we can do with carbon that we haven't sort of discussed. You can change, for example, the portfolio composition, which is something that you can only do when in carbon because it's got like different dimensions. Um, we can choose protocol fee levels and uh, which protocols we want to simulate, which animations we want, and and how to put them, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, this is um, you know fundamentally it's a it's meant to be a financial tool, um, but you know at, at some level. It's also just, you know, like a, a textbook now of, um, of, you know, of, of bonding curve, um, you know, bonding curve theory. So, you know, each one of these functions kind of represents a, a certain component of, um, of amplified or, uh, or concentrated liquidity. And, you know, just to see how some of these um, functions operate and, um, you know, how to analyze them, I think would be something that you guys might get a... A, a lot of value from, and I'm very happy to, to share this stuff.
That looks awesome. Yeah, I would love to play around with that. And it's too bad Sean is uh, out and about today because I know he's working on some dashboards that were, has been working on dashboard stuff uh, in the BCRG. So I'll make sure he catches this recording because I think some of these things would be uh, amazing to to pour through with the, the technical literacy as well. Okay. Mike, do you have a question? Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Mark. Uh, outstanding, and I uh, uh, appreciate your time, uh, your dedication, your excellent explanatory. Um, just for this uh, one question, what's your um, take on uh, Curve's new uh, Curve USD uh, type of um, system design? It, it seems to be uh, um, pretty cool in, in how it's changing that whole liquidation experience and, and offering. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, thank you, Mark. You're very welcome. Yeah, no, my take on it, I'm I'm a, a very big fan of um pretty much everything that Curve does. Curve V2 wasn't I didn't like Curve V2 very much. Um, but yeah, Curve V1 and their their Llama um lending system is is beautiful. Um the idea of um and the way that they've implemented it so that you can sort of be unliquidated um you know if your collateral sort of regains value um is extremely interesting um the you know, i haven't had the the time to sort of really sit down and um and and digest it so like i, I don't feel like i've got the the level of erudition required to sort of speak with authority on it but um at least from the outset the uh, i i'm extremely impressed with it i, I think that it's it's um, it's exactly the the level of of creativity and um, and you know um, problem solving that um, that that Curve has kind of incorporated into their brand. So it's uh yeah it's an extremely impressive piece of kit. Oh, and our simulation just finished, so you can see here that we're actually you know um, you know generating these plots and things. But yeah. Awesome. I'm anything. sure uh, there will be a ton of there will be a ton of uh, follow up questions as we uh, as we pour through some of the content from the last few we've actually talked about. Um, yeah, re re um, packaging or or taking out snippets of some of these talks and and being able to to um, push some of that that information even further. So hopefully, um, yeah, we'll we'll be able to continue and or have some uh, follow up on perhaps questions or I mean further advancements in these tools. Uh, it's amazing that even in just the past few years, there's been so many um, experiments and, as you say, so many uh, re-applications of, of the same invariants. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious where where the new use cases, where new contexts will, um, you know, push further evolution of these tools. Did you have another question, Mike, or is your hand just I did. I did. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for, for being um, for hogging. Uh, Mark, one more question. Um, are you familiar with a protocol uh, called Dopex? Yeah. Um, yes, I am. What's your thought on their new, they call it CLAM. They're utilizing Uniswap's V3 by uh, providing um, option profiling at each bin in the um, concentrated li liquidity that V3 offers. It's, it's really cool. Uh, they had an MVP out where they let users test it out with just the ARB token, um, but it could be um, a really interesting, like um, a derivative to entice liquidity and utilize liquidity that I guess would just sit dormant. Yeah. It, it, if a... you don't have any thoughts, all good. It's pretty fresh, but I just wanted to throw it out there. Yeah, I, I thank you for telling me um because I didn't I wasn't aware. Did you say it was called Clam? Yeah, I didn't make a mistake. They, they call it Clam. C L A M M. Okay. It's kind of like concentrated uh, liquidity uh, automated market maker. Got it. Yeah, look, um I don't know uh I, I wasn't aware of it. But what I am uh, I what I am aware of are um other like uh, quadratic option pricing models. So the the people that really pioneered um, that uh, you know this space or the idea that you can write an option 
um, on top of um, an AMM. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, like full Black Shoals um, style, or, you know, fair options pricing. Um, the first project to do it um, successfully was uh, was called Squeeth or Squared ETH. And um, there, you, I, I highly recommend reading Incredible the, um, product, the documentary. Mark. What's that? I said incredible product, man. Squeef is yeah, uh, remarkable. That power perpetual, unbelievable. Um, yeah, yeah, you really get remarkable product with no liquidation. Yeah, it's really, um, it's not available for U.S. residents. Just if anyone's a citizen, uh, it, it just changed in the last um, about six months. You what? You might also be familiar with um, with Guillaume Lambert's product, um, Panoptic. Do you have you heard of Panoptic? No, sir. Okay, so Panoptic, uh, I, uh, I I definitely recommend, um, you should learn who Guillaume Lambert is um, and read some of the stuff that he's produced. So he actually has a, um, he, he's shown that there is a way that you can treat options pricing that uh, basically approaches Black Shoals um, on a, um, you know, uh, on, under some conditions. And what he what he did was to create an, a full options protocol built exclusively on top of Uniswap v3. It wouldn't surprise me if um, if the the clam product is at least inspired by um, some of the the work that Panoptic has done. Um, but it's it's similarly impressive. Um, Wicked. The, I'll look into that. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, my pleasure. How did you spell that? Um, S Q E T H was it? Squeeth? Squeeth? Squeeth, yeah. Yeah, so the, they actually have a, um, a formal proof of um, the it's equivalent with Black Shoals, but non linear. Yeah. Cool. Nice. All these links on the Panoptic Twitter as well. And if anybody wants to follow that, they're Panoptic XYZ. Just drop the link in the chat here if I can copy it. Good stuff. Awesome. Any other questions or should we wrap it up um, and then save more chats for next time? I'm sure there'll be lots. I'll share everything with um with Rabbit again via email. And so I'll let him distribute some of the material back to you guys. But anyone who wants the simulator that I just shown, reach out to me directly. Sounds great. Thanks so much, Mark. Great presentations and uh, looking forward to having you back for uh, for another set. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope that it was uh, useful. Yeah, definitely. Super inspiring. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Have sure. a great day, folks. Catch y'all again soon.